Today, we're going to finish the series that we've been on. Grab your Bibles and go to the book of Luke. Go to the book of Luke. And as you're going there, come on, why don't you smile at the person you're sitting next to and tell them you look phenomenal this morning. Say hi to a few people sitting next to you. Smile at them. Come on, an additional seating in the chats. Why don't you look at the person on the opposite side and tell them, I want you to know you're sitting next to the best looking person in the building. <laughs> Say it with some confidence. Makeup dripping down your face and all, it doesn't matter. My friend Stone is here. Stone, I'm glad you're in the building. I love you. Got a lot of friends and family in the building. We love it. Go to Luke, Luke chapter 23. If you don't have a Bible, why don't you share with the person next to you? And if you don't know them, it's okay. Make it awkward. If you're single and they're single, it's Resurrection Sunday. Come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Luke chapter 23. We're also going to put it up on the screens in case you don't have a Bible. Luke chapter 23. We've been in the series called Seven. Can somebody say seven? seven. Uh, they say that you should pay attention to people's last words before they die because they're important. And you might learn something about them, or they may give you some lessons for your life. The Bible across four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, lets us know that Jesus had some final words on the cross as he's dying. And they become known as the seven last statements of Jesus. Over the last six weeks, we've looked at them, studied them. And I think it's been one of my favorite series so far that we've done all year. Today we're going to finish on the last statement that he said on the cross before he died. And I know it's Resurrection Sunday and you're saying we're still talking about the cross, but it's going to tie into resurrection what he said. And, and I'm excited about it. Beginning in verse 44, if you're there, can you say amen? amen? The Word of God says like this. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus calling out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And having said this, he breathed his last. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Today, let's finish up this series. Let's look at this statement. Why don't we say this together? Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. It's the last prayer of Jesus on the cross. The last, last words he says. What does he mean? What does this mean to us? They're significant. And I think if we look at them, maybe for about the next 20, 20 something moments, um, I think they'll speak alive to us today. And I think they'll help us as we celebrate a risen Savior. So let's talk about Jesus, then we'll worship together, and then we'll go outside and let's have a party. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your love and kindness toward us. Thank you for loving people like us. God, we don't deserve it. There's nothing we could do to earn it. But you've been so kind to all of us. Thank you for Calvary Church, every single person across every service today, everybody connected online. Everybody that calls Calvary home, thank you for this family, this household of faith. Pray that you would bless us today, that you would open up our eyes, that you would lift up our heads to see you, precious Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice. And thank you that you're alive and we have victory today. And it's in that name of Jesus that we pray that all of God's people say, Amen. Oh, come on. All of God's people say, Amen. Can you make some noise for Jesus? Amen. One more time. Come on. read a story recently about an old painting that was hanging in the corner of your museum. The painting was called Checkmate. And this painting had two characters on it. One looked like the devil. The other one was a young man who seemed to be disillusioned and downcast and he was troubled. Right in the middle of the painting, there was an angel and it seemed like the young man was battling and playing a game of chess for his soul. The character of the devil had a smirk on his face because he thought he was about to win the game. He looked like he was about to beat the young man and perhaps take his soul. 
One day, an old chess player who had played it for many years and had even taught other people how to play chess, he walks into the museum and he's staring at the painting for a while. And After some time, he calls over the attendant and he says, I believe we have to change the name of this painting. And the attendant is like, what do you mean? It's called Checkmate. That's been the name since the original painter painted it. And he says, maybe so, but maybe the painter wanted us to look at it closer because the young man has a game on his hands that he may not comprehend because the game is not over. And then he said this line, the king still has one more move to make. The king still has one more move to make. I believe that this morning as we gather in here to celebrate Easter and Resurrection Sunday is because our king still has one more move to make. I think life, life for a lot of us can look like the young man's game and it can look like we are defeated and beat down. In fact, around the world, it can seem like this is the spirit of civilization at the time right now because of the present moment that we're living in. It is hard times. You look around the world, it is difficult and challenging times that we are going through. Gasoline prices are at an all-time high. We're all about to buy a couple bicycles and come ride our way to work. Can I get an amen? amen. Inflation keeps going up. We hear the rumors of war, possible nuclear war, chemical warfare, and all of this can begin to drain our soul and weigh heavy on our shoulders. And if we're not careful, hope will begin to leak out of our soul and out of our spirit because we're living in pressing times and in challenging times around the world. For some of us, we don't need a macro state of the world. Let's go into the microsphere of our own lives. It's the vicious cycle of our own routines that have us down. And some of us today, we're walking in here saying, when is life going to change? It's the same old, same old. And nothing gets better. My, my marriage doesn't get better. And I think we're actually on the verge of a divorce. My kids are all over the place. My health doesn't improve. And maybe somebody in our family has a terminal illness. And we're trying to walk in here on a resurrection Sunday. But down, deep down inside, we're feeling defeated. We're feeling down. We have no hope. Because everything that we have stood for, everything that we believed for, everything that we thought would be steady has now been jolted and rocked, especially in the past 24 months of our world. And when your life gets rocked, it will affect your hope. In fact, I put it this way, a shaken world can cause a shattered hope. When your world is shaken, when you are rocked by some bad news, some bad report, a text or a call you weren't expecting, all of a sudden your outlook for the future can look grim. What will happen tomorrow? And is there even any kind of hope for, the, for tomorrow? And we begin to think, I don't know if it's even possible for this to turn on. You know what I believe has happened? I believe that we've made hope something that is situational, not convictional. A lot of us, we have hope based on the circumstances of our life, not on the convictions of our spirit. And so if life is going well, we have hope and we wake up and we have a pep in our step. And this morning you say good morning to your spouse and you turn around and you're like, wow, you look different. Life is amazing. I got hope. It is awesome. And you throw a thumbs up and you smile in every Easter picture and you don't like the Easter bunny, but something about it, you feel like hugging him and kissing him because today you woke up in a good mood. There's hope on the inside because life is well. But when life goes bad, it seems to affect our hope and you wake up and you're like, if the bad buddy gets in front of me, I will. I don't want to take a picture with nobody. I have no hope. I'm upset at life because life has been difficult. But hope is not based on our circumstances. But hope is based on the, on the risen Savior that we have named Jesus. Oh, follow me for a minute. I don't have hope because of my health. I don't have hope because of my job. I don't have hope because everything is well in life. I have hope because over 2,000 years ago, there was a man who went into a grave and three days later, the stone was rolled away. I have hope today, not because of anything in my life, but because who I trust with my life. This is what hope is. Are you following me? In fact, I looked up a definition of biblical hope, what the Bible says hope is, and I like the way this author put it. He said, hope is an expectation with certainty that God will do what he has said. That's some good hope. Now, here's the thing. Hope is connected to faith. Somebody say faith. faith. Faith is the foundation that hope stems out of. 
In other words, faith is knowing who God is. Hope is knowing what God will do. Faith is knowing I know who my God is. I know who I believe. I know he's real. I know what he stands for. And because he's real, because I trust him, then I know he'll do what he promised that he would do. So faith and hope are tied together. Are you following me? And I think over the past 24 months especially, some of us have come to find out whether you're here in a digital seating or connected online, we've come to find out I had my faith in the wrong thing all along. I had it, I had it on a banking system. I had it on Wall Street. I had it on a relationship and I thought this person would be it and I thought my life would forever be fixed on this thing. And we made it circumstantial and so our hope became bleak over the last 24 months because this job closed down and this relationship passed and this health didn't get better and I lost my mom and I lost my uncle and I lost my grandma and because things didn't work out the way we thought our hope for tomorrow is gone and some of us are in here today with no hope but I came to tell you that this is why we celebrate Easter because our faith is not in a banking system our faith is not in who's in Washington our faith is not based on anything it's not on my bank account or on my health I got my faith connected to a risen savior and because he's alive I have hope for tomorrow because he's alive oh come on no matter what may come I got hope that tomorrow will be a brighter day, whether I'm here or not. Come on, the best is yet to come because my king still has a move to make. In fact, I actually put it this way. You can be full of hope because the grave is empty. He emptied the grave so your life can be full of hope. You can wake up in the morning and no matter what your life looks like, you can say, I got some hope. Tell the person next to you, I got hope. Luke chapter 23, we get to the gospel of Luke. There's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke, as we've studied and talked about, Luke is a doctor and a historian, so his gospel is full of details. And it's awesome because he gives us a detailed look at who Jesus is. And we get to the 23rd chapter, and he's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. If you were here Friday night, we talked about it in detail. The crucifixion was gruesome, and it was difficult. And it was a bloodbath, and many believe you can see the bones of Jesus from the outside as a crown of thorns came over his head as he was gasping for air, hanging on a cross. And as he's there, hanging on a cross, he begins to say some words. And these words, I'm glad that the authors of the gospel captured them because they've been speaking to us over the last few weeks. And it's important, you'll hear stories of what did they say before they passed. And some of us have even been at the bedside of some people that have passed, and we've heard some of their last words. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they give us an inside look at what Jesus said before he passed. Friday night, we talked about the sixth statement from the cross, what Jesus says. And Jesus said, it is finished. And we learned on Friday night that what Jesus said was not a statement of a victim, but the statement of a victor. Because he didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it is finished. Meaning everything that you and I couldn't do and all that the Father sent him to do, he did it. He completed the assignment. He paid it in full. After he says that, these are his last, last words. And he says these words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now these are important words. Because this is a prayer that you and I can look at, learn from, lean into, and say, perhaps this is how I have to pray sometimes. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. We should read this over and over, meditate, let it get deep down in your soul what Jesus meant. He prayed this on a Friday afternoon while there was darkness over his life because it was not just a word of victory this one was a word of hope because what he is praying is that he is knowing and trusting that although Friday looks dark how many know Sunday is coming and so when he says father into your hands I commit my spirit it's a prayer of hope and it's a word of hope for us today because three days later something did happen on that Friday afternoon he took his last breath they brought him down Joseph of Arimathea he came and he said I have a grave site for him and they put his body in a tomb Saturday was silent the disciples they were depressed they were disillusioned like the young man in the painting 
They thought, that's it, it's over. Here's our friend, the one that we were going to ride into Jerusalem, sit in the palace. Peter already had his outfit picked out from Saks Fifth Avenue. John was ready with his Louis Vuitton suit. They were all trying to find out who was going to sit to Jesus uh, with Jesus on which side. And all of a sudden, Jesus is in the grave on Saturday. Every promise broken. Every word diminished. But look what the Bible tells us. Luke, in the very next chapter, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 6, it says, But on the first day of the... What day is that? Why do we gather together every single Sunday morning because every time we gather together is to remember on a day like today Jesus overcame the grave on the first day of the week at early dawn they went to the tomb taking spices they had prepared and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb when they went in they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus while they were perplexed about this behold two men stood by them dazzling apparel and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Oh, come on. Friday looked dark, but Sunday morning, Jesus was coming up out of the grave because my king still had one more move that he was going to make. Peter went fishing. Some of them locked up crying, but what they didn't know is that the king still had one more move to make. We're celebrating this morning because although our life is difficult and although at times it's challenging and all my hope may be out, I have to remember that on a morning like this, Jesus, he resurrected from the dead. That means that no matter what may be happening, my king still has one more move to make. He has one more move to make over your marriage. He has one more move to make over your problem. He has one more move to make over that health issue. It's not over until God says it's over. This is what Easter is all about, that my king is alive. And as long as he's alive, he still has one more move to make. Tell somebody next to you, he still has one more move to make. Some of us, we need to get this deep down in our spirit. We need to really comprehend this. That Jesus always has something up his sleeve. Up his robe. <laughs> we hear countless stories of Jesus doing this. They throw a woman who's been caught in adultery in front of Jesus, naked and ashamed. And they're trying to trap her and they're trying to trap him. What do you say, Jesus? She's been caught in adultery. Cheated on her husband. First of all, who was looking through the window? Mm -hmm. and they thought they had trapped Jesus but what they didn't know is that Jesus would go down into the ground write something on the sand and, they say, and then say he who is without sin cast the first stone and all of them one by one began to drop their, drop their stones and walk away because King Jesus still had one more move to make blind Bartimaeus they tried to keep him away so they would not heal him and they thought, let's keep him from doing miracles and maybe Bartimaeus will be quiet. But what they did not know is that Bartimaeus would shout and Jesus wouldn't be annoyed at the shout. Jesus wouldn't be troubled by the shout, but the cry from his children would get his attention. He'll turn around and he'll heal blind Bartimaeus, even though enemies and people around try to keep him quiet because King Jesus still has one more move to make. Lazarus, one of his closest friends, is sick, and his sisters call Jesus, and they say, you need to get over here ASAP. And he says, I'll try to get over there as fast as possible, but gas prices are high. I may have to go walking. And the Bible says he doesn't get there on the third day. He gets there on the fourth day. In Jewish ancient times, after the third day, they believed the spirit already left the body. In other words, it was impossible, impossible, impossible for that person to come back to life. Jesus took an extra day on purpose. And when everybody else said he's finished, he's done, he stinketh by now in the grave. The Bible says that Jesus says, roll away the stone. And then he says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says that Lazarus came up out of the grave because my king still has a move to make. Oh, come on. 
on that good Friday when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he took his last breath as he gassed his last oxygen and air he breathed out his last and he died on the cross they laid him down in a grave all of hell was cheering they brought out the boom box they brought out the DJ the devil and all the demons were celebrating and high-fiving each other and they said we conquered the son of man he was not the Messiah we have beat him but the Bible says that on the third day what they didn't know is that my king still has a move to make death was not the end don't you put a period where God has put a comma it is never the end until God says it's the end it's not the end of your era it's not the end of your life it's not the end of your season I serve a good God he is still alive he is risen he is not dead but he is alive my king still has a move to make come on Tell the person next to you, slap him. He still has a move to make. <laughs> Some of you took that slap serious. <laughs> Jesus overcame sin and death so that you and I can have life and life to the fullest. Because he overcame death, we can have hope today. So everybody else may be counting you out. The spouse may be counting you out. The doctors may be counting you out. Maybe you think, my best days are behind me. There's no way God can do anything with my life or my marriage. I thought I had a gifting and a call, but I've been going through it. There's nothing that God, I want to tell you, the king still has one more move to make on your life. And because of that, have hope today. Let hope rise on the inside you can walk out of here different because Jesus is alive and so when he's praying this on the cross he's praying this full of hope he says father into your hands I commit my spirit what a beautiful prayer what a beautiful prayer that Jesus is praying on the cross he's saying father I know death is right after my next breath but I commit my spirit in your hands. What do we learn from this prayer? I think the first thing we can learn as we close up, I'm ready to go celebrate because it's getting hot in her. <laughs> Number one, we can trust his hands. Somebody say trust. trust. We can trust his hands. Can I tell you, the hands of the Father are the best hands that we could place our life in. It's better than Allstate, Prudential. It's better than... Come on, those are some good hands. I got a big family and I love my family and my nephew's here in the front row and I got a bunch of nephews and nieces. Have you, ever, have you ever handed something to a young kid in your family and they lose it immediately? You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever handed something to your husband and he loses it? Don't answer that one. Don't answer that one. But you, ever, you ever seen people that got bad hands? They just lose everything or they fumble and drop everything. Some of you are like, yeah, that's me. And, I'll never forget years ago, one of my nephews says, hey, can I hold the car keys? And they were really, really small and he wanted to hold the car keys. It's funny, when we're young, we love cars. Now that we're older, it's like, I don't want to drive anywhere. <laughs> and I gave him the car keys and, and it seemed like in a moment, he lost the car keys. They won't lose an iPad. They won't lose a place. They, they lost the car keys and we try to look for them everywhere. And I think a lot of times what we do is that we trust bad hands with our spirit. I think we're all, we're all guilty of this. I've placed my, my life in bad hands. Some of us today, we've placed our life in bad hands. There's only one set of hands that will forever hold you. And it's not a church. It's not a pastor. It's not religion. It's not good works. It's not good deeds. It's the good father. And his hands will never let you go. Jesus in the book of John, John tells us he does this prayer at the end of his life, right before he goes to the cross. It's a beautiful prayer. It's found in John chapter 17, and you should read it. It's a beautiful prayer. He's actually praying for you and me. And in that prayer, the Bible says that Jesus tells the Father, every single one you gave me, I haven't lost from my hands. Oh, come on. Those are some good hands. Today, some of you, you know you shouldn't even be in here. But the only reason we made it here today is because he took care of us in his hands.
Father, thank you that you've watched us. You've taken care. When I wanted to run out of his hands, come on. When I wanted to rebel and follow my own ways, I, he had me. The Bible says, he who he has in his hands, no one can snatch away. Today, I want to speak prophetically to your life, to your marriage, to your family. It's in his hands. And no matter what your emotions are telling you, no matter what your mind is telling you, I want to tell you, you are in his hands. Your life is in his hands. He's got you. He goes before you, behind you. He surrounds you. He's got you. He's never going to let you go. Come on, let hope rise on the inside. He loves you more than you can imagine. Just place your life in his hands. Trust the hands. Jesus is also quoting an earlier psalm that King David wrote hundreds of years before. He did this in the fourth statement that we talked about from Psalm 22, but today he also says the last one, Psalm 31. Look at Psalm 31, verses 1 through 3 through 5. David writes this years before. He says, you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net that they have hidden for me. For you are my refuge. Verse 5, into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. David wrote this hundreds of years before Jesus was hanging on a cross. In fact, this line was so recognized by ancient Jewish culture that most people believe this is a prayer every single Jewish child would pray before they go to sleep. Kind of like we do today. Now I lay me down to sleep. This is their line. Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. So when Jesus says this, they recognize this. They know this is Psalm 31. Now, what I love is that David, he sandwiches that prayer between refuge and redemption. He says, you are my refuge and you have redeemed me. And that's why I placed my life in the middle of your hands. In other words, he goes before me and he goes behind me. Here's my rear guard and he's my front bumper. Come on, I'm grateful that I have a refuge and that I have redemption. And in his hands, I trust my life. Today, it doesn't matter what's surrounding you. Even if it's death itself, he's your refuge and your redemption. And you could place your life in his hands. Those are some good hands. So we look to Jesus and we say, God, into your hands. I, tr I put my spirit in your hands the same way that Jesus did. Number one, you can trust the hands. Number two, surrender your will. Surrender your will. Jesus on the cross, he's teaching us surrender. Because I think every single one of us, we've wanted to follow our own will at times. I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and can't nobody tell me nothing. We all do that. We all have our own plans and desires and emotions and it's normal. And sometimes this is what I think my life is going to look like over the next few days. And we make all kinds of plans, but we don't really know if we're even going to be here tomorrow. It's the truth. Nobody can even guarantee I will be here tomorrow. You can't guarantee that. But we make all kinds of plans. And here's what I've come to find out in my own life, young, young life. Uh, that when I make my own plans and I trust my own plans and I follow my own plans and I don't surrender them to the will of the Father, when they don't happen, I lose hope. Because my hope was based out of what I designed for my life, not out of God's design for my life. Jesus on the cross, he's surrendering his will. And he's saying, Father, into your hands, not only do I trust, but I give up all of my plans, everything that I think, and I, and I, I actually want to follow your will. Because if you follow his will, not only will you have hope, you'll have resurrection. Even when things don't pan out and play out the way you think, you wait three days. And I'm telling you, there's resurrection always at the end of his will. I think there's some people here today, perhaps an additional seating in the lobby, online. I really felt this early and I sense it now. There's some people here, this, this is your move today. You need to surrender. You've been running for a long time. Some of you, you didn't even want to come in here today. I know it's uncomfortable. I've been to church in a long time. I don't even know how I got to dress or anything. Listen, you can come in here as you are. Most of us never dress like this. It's only for Easter. <laughs> Listen, surrender today. Stop running. Stop running. I don't know who this is for. Stop running. 
You've been following your own will, your own plans. You keep running into walls and you keep bumping and, and you have to do over and do over, do over. Today, there's a better plan for your life. It's in the Father's hands. Surrender your will. He loves you. He's for you. He's for you. Surrender. Today, you need to throw up your hands and say, I surrender. Trust his hands. Surrender your will. We'll finish with this and the band can come up. And we're going to sing one more worship song and then we're going to go enjoy outside. Number three, because you surrender, you can also live with hope live with hope resurrection Sunday you know what it means that every single day you and I can wake up and we can have hope in our soul and can I tell you that's the way to live you can't live without hope and the God that we serve he resurrected Jesus from the dead so that you and I can have hope the Bible says he's the God of hope and I believe there's people here today watching online, perhaps in the lobby or this room, you've had no more hope. Or you feel like your hope has been low. Today, he wants to fill you with hope on the inside. Not circumstantial hope, convictional hope. Are you following me? Very different. Very, very different, church. Today, he wants to give us hope based off of him, not off the world. Look what the Bible says, Romans chapter 15, last verse. The Apostle Paul, he's writing to the church in Rome, and this is his prayer for the church. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Oh, come on. You may abound in, you may abound in hope. That word abound, it literally means to overflow out of your life. And what I think is that some of us, we've been there, we've had hopeless days. You ever, you ever had a hopeless day? Where you just feel like nothing's working out. Ain't nothing gonna work out. Ain't nothing ever gonna. And when you go through one of those days, it's hard to comprehend that line. Overflow, abound with hope. But that's who God is. He's the God of the impossible. And if Jesus can conquer a grave, you can wake up with hope tomorrow. I read a story about a family that was in a Nazi concentration camp and they were trying to run away from the concentration camp and the father gathers his family late at night and he says we're making a run for it and they have to light up some lanterns and he uses the last little bit of oil that they have and he lights up the lanterns and they start their journey and they start their walk and the son grabs his father and he says dad you used up all the oil how will we eat tomorrow and the father says, son, a body can survive up to 30 days without food. But without hope, we won't survive three days. Can I tell you, because Jesus conquered the grave, you can have, have hope tomorrow. You can have hope on Tuesday. You can have hope on Wednesday. You can wake up a year from now and have hope. Oh, you can wake up three years from now. You may have health or you may not have health. You may have your job or not have your job. Your marriage may survive or it may not survive. But I have hope not based of what is in this world. I have hope because my hope is in a risen Jesus who overcame the grave and because Jesus is alive. I know my king still has one more move to make. He's gonna make it. Somehow, some way, he'll do something in my life. I want us to stand up to our feet. I want us to stand up to our feet all across this place. I really sense the Holy Spirit is here. Come on, why don't we close our eyes and lift up our hands. Come on, some of us, we need hope today. We need hope today. You've been hopeless. You've been hopeless. You've been down and out. It feels like hope has leaked out of your soul, your spirit. You feel like you're not the same person that you were two years ago, three years ago. Plans have failed. Marriages have failed. Relationships have failed. People have backstabbed you and talked about you and people have complained about you and criticized you. Some of you standing here, life looks nothing like what you planned it out to be and you're frustrated and you're upset and you're saying, I wish my life would have looked different. I'm here to tell you he's the God of hope and today he wants you to fill you till you overflow and abound with hope. Come on, why don't we lift up our hands and just ask him to fill you with hope. The Bible says he'll give you joy and peace and hope till it 
overflows, that means it's going to pour out into other people in your life. All of a sudden, that hope in you, it, it will touch your brother. And, and all of a sudden, everybody in your family will begin to have joy and hope and peace because it's overflowing from you. Come on, tell them today, I need some hope in my life, God. Fill me with hope. Jesus conquered the grave. and My king still has a move to make, and I have hope. Holy Spirit, I pray that you fill every single person in this auditorium, in additional seating, in the lobby area, online, every single person connected, God, that you may fill us with hope as we trust your hands and as we surrender to your will so that we can wake up tomorrow with hope, not based off what I have, but who I have. I have King Jesus, and he is risen. I have hope. Today, I pray that hope begins to rise on the inside, God, for every family, for every marriage, for health situations, for prayer requests, for people who are in need. Let hope rise on the inside. You're for them. You're with them. You've never left them. You've never abandoned them. Somebody here, you think God has forgotten about you. I want to tell you, he hasn't forgotten about you. He loves you. He's with you. Today, you walked in desperate. You thought this is it. I've been praying and it feels like it's, it's falling on deaf ears. I want to tell you, he has heard your every prayer. He loves you. He's watching over you. Your life is in his hands. He's never going to let you go. You can rest in his hands. God, fill us with hope right now. Joy, peace. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you're for us. You're awesome, God. Thank you, King Jesus. With every eye closed, with every head bowed, I want to pray for one last group of people. We'll make our way out. Come on, as we're all praying in this place, maybe you're here today and this is your first time with us. Maybe you're standing in the lobby somewhere in additional seating and you're saying, Alex, I've never been in this place. I'm glad that you're here. And, and I know it's been a little bit hot and maybe uncomfortable. I'm sorry. But I know that it's not a coincidence that you're here. I really believe that God brought you in here for a reason and for a purpose. Maybe you're watching online and you're saying, I don't even know how I, how I clicked on this link. I believe God wanted to speak to you today. Maybe you're here and you're saying, Alex, this sounds okay, but this is not for me. I feel far from God. I feel distant from God. There's, there's things I've done that nobody knows about. There's no way God could love somebody like me. And I want to tell you, none of us are perfect. The Bible says every single one of us are sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We've all failed. We've all done wrong, thought wrong, said wrong. Every single human being falls short of God's perfect standard. And the Bible says that God knows that and he loves us still. It says, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him shall not die but have everlasting life. Today, come on, as we're all praying with eyes closed, head bowed. Maybe you're in here saying, Alex, that's me. I need forgiveness today. I know I got sin in my life. I know I've done wrong, thought wrong, said wrong. I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm sick of being tired. I want a brand new beginning. I want God to help me. I want a relationship with God. Maybe you're like me. You grew up in church and perhaps you backslid and you're saying, Alex, I, I haven't been in church in a long time. And I feel like I broke my relationship with God. Today, you can come back home. In fact, I'm going to count to three in just a moment. And when I count to three, if you're in here and you say, Alex, I need Jesus. I want you to raise your hand. Hold it up for a few seconds. I just want to see who I'm praying for, and then you can put it right back down. Come on, as the church is praying, in a moment of prayer, in a moment of privacy. Some of you, you already feel that tug in your heart. You need to give your life to Jesus. Today, that was for you. You need to surrender. Surrender. On Easter 2022, you need to surrender your life, and, and you need to receive his life. It's a good life. It's a life full of hope, joy, peace. Today, you want to start a relationship with God. You need forgiveness for your sins. Today, you're saying, Alex, I need a brand new beginning. At the count of three, raise your hand. Hold it up for about two, three seconds, and you can put it right back down. Come on, as Calvary's praying. One, two, three. If that's you, hold it up as high as you can, as high as you can. Hands being raised up all over this place. Come on, raise it up as high as you can. God bless you. 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 I see 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 you. God bless 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 you. Awesome. Come on, in additional seating in the lobby. Why don't you raise your hands as high as you can? Put your hands back down. Come on, let's pray together as one big family. Come on, every eye closed. Anybody else? You're saying, that was me. You raise your hand. Today, I need to surrender. I need to surrender. You raise your hands. Come on, let's pray together. 
Thank you, Jesus. Let's say this prayer together in one big voice. The Bible says, if you want to be saved, you got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. That's what we're doing together. And we're going to do it with you, one big family. Come on, repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity. I admit that I'm a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. Come on, say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God that you died for my sins and on the third day you rose again Jesus come into my life be my Lord and be my Savior from today on I'm forgiven I'm saved and I'm healed in Jesus name amen amen oh come on amen thank you John Hands went up all over. Can we thank King Jesus? Hey, hands went up all over the auditorium. If you're watching online and you did that prayer, let us know in the chats. If you're in additional seating or lobby, we got a free Bible for you. We're all about to go outside right now, whether it's the carnival out back or the patio in the front. But there's a, there's a tent there that says Connect Tent. Pass by and pick it up. This tent is for every new Christian. Even if you don't have a Bible, pick it up. It's absolutely free. We buy it for new believers free. Pick it up. No strings attached. Absolutely not. Just pick it up. We want to give it to you as a gift. We love you. One more time. Give them a big, big hand. Come on. Every single person. Come on. Anybody thankful that we got Jesus? That we had hope? Oh, come on. Anybody thankful for Easter 2022? Come on. We got hope on the inside. Let's pray to leave this place. We're going to leave out of here singing, Can You See What I See? Come on, let's throw a party in this place. Hug somebody next to you. Give them a high five. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this Easter, Resurrection Sunday. Thank you that because of you, we have hope. Go before us this week, behind us, and surround us. We love you, Jesus. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. It's in that name of Jesus that we pray. And all of God's people say,